So we're going to work our way through the practice final. We're just going to start at the beginning and work our way through all the problems. So starting with question number one says solve the following system algebraically. Remember your answer should be written as two ordered pairs. So for this one, we have a quadratic equation and a linear equation. They both, however, equal y. Since they both equal y, they both have to equal each other. So this part is going to equal this part down here. So I'm going to start over here on the left with x squared plus 5, oops, x plus 2. And that's going to equal the 3x plus 5. So since they both equal y, they must both equal each other. Now we have a quadratic equation. We need to move everything to one side. So we're going to subtract 3x from both sides and subtract 5. Subtract 3x from the other side and subtract 5. So when we do that, we're going to end up with x squared plus 2x minus 3 equals 0. Once your quadratic is set equal to zero, you may use your asterisks to figure out your factors. So one goes in the top left and the top right. Two goes in the bottom middle. And then in the top middle, you have one times negative three, which is negative three. So now you're looking to find two numbers that multiply to give you negative three, but add to give you two. That would be three and negative one. So here on the sides are my two factors. Remember we add our variables to the top. So three X, I mean one X plus three and one X minus one. So there are my two factors. Once you get your two factors, again, they're being multiplied together and their product is zero. That means you use the zero product property to set them both equal to zero. So now I have x plus three equals zero and x minus one equals zero. Figure out that x equals negative three and x equals one. Once you find these x values, you must plug them back in to find the y value that coordinates with them. So for x equals three, we're gonna take that three and we're gonna plug it in into the linear equation for the x. So y equals three times x, which we're plugging in negative three plus five. And then I'm just going to simplify. So negative three times three is negative nine. Negative nine plus five is negative four. So we used an X value of negative three. We got a Y value of negative four. So right here is one of my two answers. We're going to do the same thing with x equals 1. We're going to take that 1. You can plug it into either equation to find y, but the bottom one, the linear one, is going to be the easiest. So 3 times 1 plus 5. Well, 3 times 1 is 3 plus 5 is 8. So for my second ordered pair, the x value was 1. The y value we got was 8, which gives us the ordered pair 1 comma 8. So two answers in this case, again, they're both ordered pairs. Questions on this one? Moving to question number two. Question number two is a composition of functions. Find f of g of three. That means we're going to plug g into f. So we're going to take we're going to take this, all of that, and we're going to put it right there where that x sits. 
So we're going to take negative 3 and then all of that 2x squared minus 1 plus 4. Then we're going to distribute the negative 3 into the parentheses. So negative 6x squared plus 3 and then the plus 4 comes down at the end. Want to combine like terms here, so negative 6x squared plus 7. This is as simplified as it gets, but if I look back at the original, I was told right here that I'm going to take my answer, get rid of the x's, and replace them with 3's. That gives me negative 6 times 3 squared plus 7. We're taking that 3 and we're going to plug it in. And then we're just going to simplify. So 3 squared has to come first. 3 squared is 9. So negative 6 times 9 plus 7. Well, negative 6 times 9 is negative 54. And then negative 54 plus 7 is negative 47. So negative 47 would be my final answer for that question. Question number three, is the relation a function? Why or why not? In this case, it is not a function. Uh, about the easiest way you could tell me is that it doesn't pass the vertical line test. Yep. You could tell me that um, an X value has more than one Y value. There's more than one output for every or for some of your inputs. Remember your vertical line test says if you draw any vertical line on the graph and it crosses the graph more than once, so it's crossing here and here, it's not a function. We always use the analogy of the pop machine. If I'm pushing the Pepsi button, I better get a Pepsi every time. Not sometimes I get a Pepsi, sometimes I get a diet. Questions on these two? Question number four, we're asked to simplify. Here we just have a subtraction problem. The tricky thing about this question is a lot of times students forget to distribute this negative. They'll put it with the eight, but they won't put it with the negative three. So first thing you wanna do is distribute that negative so 4 minus 5i stays the same. When I distribute the negative to the negative 8, it becomes positive 8. The negative to the negative 3i becomes positive 3i. So we've distributed that negative from the middle and to both terms in that second set of parentheses. Once you get here, all you want to do is combine like terms. Well, I have 4 plus 8. These two terms get put together. 4 plus 8 is 12. Then these two terms get put together. Just because they're imaginary doesn't mean anything at this point. There's no i squared. You just want to combine them like you would negative 5x and positive 3x. So negative 5i plus positive 3i is negative 2i. You can't do anything else with that. 12 minus 2i is your final answer. Questions on this one? Question number five. It feels like forever ago when we've done this. So graph the quadratic equation and answer questions A through D. 
So here we're given y equals negative x squared minus 4x minus 3. We're asked to, for part A, find the axis of symmetry. Your axis of symmetry, the formula is on your reference sheet, negative b divided by 2a. So we're going to take the opposite of b and divide it by 2 times whatever a is. In this case, a is 1, b is negative 4, and c is negative 3. So if I take the opposite of b, the opposite of negative 4 is positive 4. Divided by 2 times a, a in this case is negative 1. So when I simplify this, I have negative 2 on the bottom, 4 divided by negative 2 is negative 2. So my axis of symmetry is x equals negative 2. <clears throat> The next thing we're asked to find is the vertex. Keep in mind that we just found the x coordinate of the vertex. We know it's going to be negative 2 comma something for our vertex. We have to find that y value by taking the negative 2 and plugging it into the original. You must be very careful with all the negatives in this problem. So when I look back at the original, I have y equals negative and then x squared. So my x squared is going in parentheses like this. So you have negative and then parentheses negative 2 squared minus 4 times negative 2 again minus 3. So make sure you've got all of those negatives in there. You can type this in your calculator as long as you type it in exactly like we have it written, you should get a y value of 1, which tells us we have the order pair negative 2, 1 for our vertex. So negative 2. So our vertex is going to be over here. I just went ahead and plotted that on my graph. Start at the origin, go left two for the negative two, up one for the positive one. When we go to graph this, we need five points on our graph if we can, but we really only have to do the work on two of them because we can use that axis of symmetry to reflect. So when you make your XY table, it doesn't matter really what two X values you plug in, as long as you're picking either two to the left of the vertex. So two X's to the left will be negative three and negative four, or you go two X's to the right and do negative one and zero. I would do negative one and zero because zero is always easy. So then I would just go up in my calculator, edit what I had written, change these negative twos to negative ones. Hit enter and it'll tell you zero. Then go back and change them to zeros, and you get a y value of negative 3. That gives me these two points right here. That's half of my graph. So keep in mind, here's my axis of symmetry. My axis of symmetry cuts my graph in half. So I'm going to reflect these two points over the axis of symmetry. So the order pair negative one, zero gets put over here at negative three, zero. Same height, same distance away from the axis of symmetry. Same thing with zero, negative three, keep the same height. It was two units to the right, so I moved two units to the left and I put my new point. And then I have my five points, so I'm just going to connect them. Like this. The last thing we were asked for part D, we're asked for the zeros. The zero is just asking you, where does your graph cross the x-axis? 
So I cross the x axis at negative one and I cross it at negative three. You could tell me x equals negative one, x equals negative three. Do not list them as an ordered pair. You can't list them as negative three comma one, negative one or negative one comma negative three. You have to list them separately. Questions on this one? Question number six, find all the zeros, real or complex, of the function y equals 4x to the third minus x squared minus 8x plus 2. So first thing I notice when I look at this, I have four terms. Anytime I'm asked to find zeros, I'm asking you to factor. If you have four terms, you're going automatically to factor by grouping. Factor by grouping only occurs when you have four terms. Split it in half, take the greatest common factor of the left side, greatest common factor of the right side. So looking here, we have 4x to the third minus x squared. If I take, <clears throat> excuse me, the greatest common factor out, I can take an x squared out of the first two terms. When I do that, it leaves me with 4x minus one. So if I take that negative x squared and I factor out an x squared, it just leaves me with negative one. For the second half, right after the split is a negative, so I'm gonna factor out some negative number. In this case, eight x and two are both divisible by two. So my greatest common factor of the right side is going to be negative two. So I'm dividing both terms by negative two. So negative eight X divided by negative two is positive four X. And then positive two divided by negative two is negative one. If we've done this correctly, our two sets of parentheses should match. In this case, they do. They're both four X minus ones. So we're gonna bring down 4x minus one into one set of parentheses. In our other set of parentheses, we're gonna write the greatest common factors together. So x squared minus two. So now we have our two sets of parentheses. We're gonna set them both equal to zero. So 4x minus one equals zero, x squared minus two equals zero. So we're using that zero product property since they both multiply together and give you zero, one of them must or both of them could equal zero. Solve them individually. So 4x minus one equals zero. Add one to both sides to get 4x equals one. Divide both sides by four and x equals one fourth. If you can leave it as one fourth, you don't have to convert it to a decimal. For the second one, we have x squared minus two equals zero. The first thing we wanna do is add two to both sides. That gives us x squared equals two. We don't wanna know the value of x squared, we wanna know the value of x. So to get rid of the squared, we must square root both sides. Keep in mind, since we are putting both the square roots in, that's when you have to put that plus or minus in. So x equals plus or minus the square root of two. Again, you don't have to convert that to a decimal. Just leave it as plus or minus the square root of two. Questions on this one. 
questions seven and eight, you're just being asked to simplify. For question seven, you have a quadratic on the top, quadratic on the bottom. But when you go to factor this, the first thing you always check for is a greatest common factor. Looking at the top, there is no greatest common factor, but when you get to the bottom, there is a greatest common factor. You must factor it out or you're gonna end up with the incorrect answer. So I'm gonna go ahead and just factor that out, leaving the top the same. So I'm gonna factor out a two from the denominator to get x squared plus five x plus four. Once you factor out that greatest common factor, then you can use your asterisks to factor the numerator and the new parentheses in the denominator. So for the numerator, when I fill this out, I have one in the top left and top right. I have 13 in the bottom middle and one times 36, which is 36 in the top middle. So I'm looking for two numbers that multiply to give me 36, but add to give me 13. You should pick four and nine. Nine times four is 36, nine plus four is 13. So now the numerator is going to be X plus four and X plus nine. For the denominator, we're gonna take, bring the two down and then we're going to factor what's inside our parentheses. So for my asterisks, I have one in the top left, one in the top right, five in the bottom middle and one times four, which is four in the top middle. Two numbers that multiply to give us four but add to give us five, four and one which gives us x plus four and x plus one. So cancel out the x plus fours because they're the same in the numerator and denominator, giving us x plus nine in the numerator, the two, the greatest common factor we factored out earlier, and then the x plus one in the denominator. questions on this one. Question number eight is a box problem. I'm asking you to multiply five plus four I times seven minus two I. Again, just a box problem. So five plus four I, doesn't matter what side you write what on. And then seven minus two I, on the other side and we're going to pause. <laughs> we want to interrupt just for a second. All right, so when we multiply these, we're just multiplying corresponding parts. So for the top left box, we're gonna take seven times five, to get 35. We're gonna take four I times seven to get 28 I. We're gonna take five times negative two I to get negative 10 I. The bottom right box is the tricky box. When we multiply negative two I times four I, we get negative eight. I squared. Remember, you're never allowed to give me an answer with I squared in it. You must take it out and replace it with negative one. So in this case, negative eight times negative one, this box really holds a value of positive eight. The last thing you need to do is combine like terms here and here. So when I combine my like terms, I have 35 plus eight, 35 plus eight is 43. And then negative 10 I plus 28 I is 18 I. You're allowed to have I in your answer. You're not allowed to have that I squared. 
So final answer, 43 plus 18i. Questions on this one? The next question is my favorite question on the test. Anybody know why it's my favorite? Yep, you can just pick out the order pair. You really don't have to do any work. You have to know that your vertex comes from these two numbers, but one of them, you must flip the sign on. When you take this negative three out of the parentheses, it changes signs to positive, and then the last number just comes down. So your vertex is the order pair three, four. Inside's opposite, outside stays the same. So the negative three becomes a positive three, and then the positive four comes down. Again, my favorite question, because you don't have to do any work. You either know what you're doing or you don't. Question number 10. So for question 10, we're being asked to simplify. We have one fraction plus another fraction. Keep in mind to combine fractions, you must have a common denominator. So first thing we're gonna identify is the least common denominator. I can't factor either one of the denominators, which means both of them are going to be part of your least common denominator. So my least common denominator in this case is going to be 3x plus 1 and x plus 2. So I want that to be the denominator of both my fractions so that I can add them together. So when I look at the first fraction, it already has the 3x plus 1, but it's missing the x plus 2. So we're going to multiply. Oh, I should have put that over here. Top and bottom by x plus 2. The bottoms we're not actually going to multiply, but the tops we are. I'm going to go ahead and just multiply that. So again, the bottom is going to be the 3x plus 1 and the x plus 2. We're not ever going to actually multiply those together. We're just going to keep writing them beside each other. But for the top, we're going to take the 2x times the x plus 2. So 2x times x is 2x squared and 2x times 2 is 4x. Then we're going to take a look at the second fraction. When I look at the second fraction and compare it to my least common denominator, it has the x plus 2, but it's missing the 3x plus 1. So we're going to multiply top and bottom by 3x plus 1. When we do this, this time we have two terms on the top times two terms from our least common denominator, two terms times two terms means we want to box them together. So we're going to box the x minus 3 times the 3x plus 1. So 3x times x is 3x squared. 3x times negative 3 is negative 9x. x times 1 is 1x and 1 times negative 3, negative 3. So for our second fraction, we're just going to combine like terms for our numerator. 3x squared stays the negative 9x plus x is negative 8x and the minus 3 comes down. And then our denominator is just going to be that 3x plus 1 and the x plus 2. The last thing you need to do, so we have two fractions now, we've created a common denominator. When you add fractions, you only add the tops together, keep the denominator the same. So we're going to add the numerators together. So I'm going to take the 2x squared plus, since it's addition here in the middle, 3x squared. Well, 2x squared plus 3x squared is 5x squared. <laughs> then I'm going to take the 4x minus 8x. 4 minus 8 is negative 4x. So that was this and this. And then I have that negative 3 hanging out by itself. It's just going to hang out by itself in your answer.
Keep in mind, this is just the numerator of our fraction. We need to keep the 3x plus 1 and the x plus 2 down in the bottom. So we created a common denominator. Once we had our common denominator, we added the numerators together. And this is our final answer. questions on these two? Yeah. Question number 11 says find the inverse of f of x equals the fourth root of x plus two minus three. So remember your steps to find your inverse. The first thing you want to do is take f of x out and replace it with y. So we're taking that f of x out and we're going to replace it with y. So y equals the fourth root x plus two minus three. The second step, we wanna switch the x and the y. So we're gonna flip the x to the y spot and the y to the x. Nothing else is changing. So we just switch the X and the Y. Once you switch them, your next objective is to solve for Y. When you solve for Y, you've got to get, in this case, the fourth root by itself. So you've got to get rid of that minus three by adding three to both sides. When we do that, the threes cancel on the right, negative three and positive three cancel each other out. So now you have X plus three equals the fourth root of Y plus two. We've got that fourth root isolated. So we isolated the radical and then we need to take it to whatever power that the index is. So in this case, we're gonna take both sides to the fourth power. The left side must be put into parentheses. So on the left side, we have x plus three in parentheses to the fourth power. On the right side, the fourth root and the fourth power cancel each other out. They're inverses like adding two and subtracting two. So they just cancel each other out, leaving you with y plus two on the right side. The last thing you need to do in this case to get y by itself, subtract two from both sides when you subtract two from that left side, you cannot subtract it from the three. So the three is involved in the parentheses. You're going to leave it in there. You're not going to touch it. The minus two just hangs out at the end. So in parentheses, x plus three to the fourth, the minus two hangs out at the end. And then the last thing you want to write it in inverse notation. So f inverse of x equals, in this case, x plus three to the fourth power minus two. Question number 12 is a division problem. Anytime we have two fractions being divided, we want to keep, change, flip. We're gonna keep the first fraction the way it is. We're gonna change the sign from division to multiplication. And when we do that, we have to flip that last fraction.
So we kept the first fraction the same. I changed the sign in the middle to multiplication, and then I flipped the last fraction. Once you do this, you just want to factor everything as much as you can. So looking at the first fraction, I have 6p minus 54. I notice that both terms are divisible by 6, so they have a greatest common factor. Same thing's true about the denominator. 8p plus 72 has a greatest common factor, in this case, 8. When I look at the second fraction, the numerator is just p plus 9. I can't do anything with that. But the denominator, I have p squared minus 11p plus 18. That is a quadratic that would require our asterisk to factor. So one in the top left and top right, negative 11 in the bottom middle, and 18 times one, or 18 in the top middle. We're looking for two numbers that multiply to give us 18, but add to give us negative 11, negative two times negative nine. So in our fraction, we're going to have P minus 2 and P minus 9. <clears throat> now that we have everything factored, we're going to go through and cancel anything that's the same in the numerator and the denominator. So I'm going to cancel the P minus 9 with the P minus 9. It doesn't matter that they're in different fractions because one's on the top and one's on the bottom. Same thing's true with the p plus nines. You also have a six and an eight sitting out front that need reduced. I can divide six and eight by two, so that's gonna become three over four. So don't forget to reduce the six and the eight. So then when I write my answer, my final answer is going to come from what didn't get canceled out. Well, looking at the top, the only thing we didn't cancel out was the three. On the bottom, we still have a 4, and we have a P minus 2. When you get to this point, double check your answer to see if it reduces any further. Well, 3 over 4 doesn't reduce. I have nothing to cancel the P minus 2 with, so that is my final answer. All right, question 13, we're using this quadratic to answer these three parts. Oops. So we were given 3x squared minus 2x equals negative 5. Before you begin, you must get 0 on one side. So I've got to get rid of that minus 5 by adding 5 to both sides. So really, I'm using 3x squared minus 2x plus 5 equals 0 for this problem. Part A says, what is the discriminant? The discriminant is the portion of your quadratic formula that's underneath the square root, the b squared minus 4ac. So I'm going to compute b squared minus 4ac, so negative 2 squared minus 4 times 3 times 5. I'm just going to type this in my calculator, so parenthesis negative 2 squared minus 4 parenthesis 3 parenthesis 5. It's going to give me a value of negative 56. So the value of the discriminant is negative 56. That number tells you the answer to part B. How many and what type of solutions does the quadratic have? So since it's negative, it's going to have two imaginary solutions. And again, I know that because it's negative. All 
Remember, if we would have gotten a positive, we would have written two real solutions. If you would get zero, it would be one real solution. So there's only three options there, two imaginaries if you get a negative number, two reals if you get a positive number, and if you happen to get zero, it's one real. And then solve using the quadratic formula. Quadratic formula x equals negative b. So opposite of negative two is positive two, plus or minus the square root. Remember, we've already found the number that goes underneath the square root. We already calculated b squared minus four ac to be negative 56. All divided by two times a, which is three. So this part shouldn't take you really long because you've cut out part of the work in part A. So then we want to simplify this. When I look at negative 56, I'm gonna have to break it apart into two numbers because it's not a perfect square. I see automatically it's divisible by four. So let's see, negative four times 14. So negative four times 14 will give you negative 56. When I square root both of those, negative four square roots as two i. The square root of negative one gives you i, the square root of four gives you two. So this is going to give you two i times the square root of 14 for the numerator, all divided by two times three, which is six. The last thing you want to do for this one is to check to see if it reduces. In this case, it does. Oops. You can only reduce these three numbers. You can't reduce the 14. It's being protected by that square root. So I can reduce the 2, 2, and the 6 to get my final answer of 1 plus or minus i, or 1i if you want to write that, square root of 14 divided by 3. Again, you can put that one in front of the eye or you can leave it off. I and one eye are the exact same thing. All right. Question 14, we're going to sketch the graph of two times two to the X power. We're always, always, always using the same five X values to do this. So I've given you a table, the X values you're gonna use, negative two, negative one, zero, one, and two. So in your calculator, two times two, carrot key, and then you're plugging in each of these numbers. You should have gotten 0.5, one, two, four, and eight. So when you graph this, your graph should look like this. Make sure that your graph does not cross the x-axis. You're not gonna ever get a negative y value for this problem. Then you have to tell me whether this growth, or whether this graph represents exponential growth or exponential decay. Yes, it is growth. There are lots of things you could use to explain why it's growth. I would just say the easiest way to say that would be because B is greater than one. Remember, the number that the exponent X is attached to is your B value. In this case, it's two. It's greater than one, so it's growth. Then you're asked for your Y intercept. Just go to your Y axis and see where your graph crosses. In this case, it crosses at two or you could write the order pair zero two. Either way works. So we just did that last week, should be fresh in your mind. Question 15, write a new equation if the graph of f of x squared has a vertical shift of four and a horizontal shift of negative one. 
So you've got to be able to identify which one of these numbers is telling you up and down and which one's telling you left or right. So vertical is going to be your up or down. Horizontal is going to be your left or right. In this case, vertical, your up or down stays the same. So you're going to have a plus four. That plus four is going to go out at the end. So we're going to have y equals x something on the inside. So that plus four goes out here at the end. For my horizontal shift of negative one, negative one tells me I want to go left one, maybe. But this one is the opposite. So when I write this on the inside, I want the opposite of negative one, so positive one. So I'm going to have x plus one in parentheses squared, plus four out at the end, which is letter A. Again, another one of those problems where it really wouldn't have to show any work. Question 16, solve the exponential equation. To solve this, you're going to want to get like bases. The left side has a base of three. I can't really rewrite three any smaller, so I'm gonna leave the left side alone. And I'm gonna see if I can write 27 as three to the something power. Conveniently, three to the third power is 27. So I've changed the way 27 was written. And then I'm going to cancel my bases. So now I have 3m minus 2 equals 3. So now we have just a basic equation to solve for m. Add 2 to both sides. So 3m equals 5. Divide both sides by 3 and m equals 5 thirds. For question 17, we're asked to write in radical form and simplify. So when we write in radical form, whatever's in your parentheses goes underneath your radical. So 625v to the eighth. Then you have to remember the three fourths, one of them stays to be the power and the other one goes down to be the index. So if we wrote three fourths as a fraction, the three would be on top. So it stays on top as an exponent. The four is the one that gets brought down to be your index. So now we have the fourth root of 625v to the eighth, all to the third power. So to evaluate this, we need to first figure out the fourth root of 625. So in your calculator, you wanna compute the fourth root of 625. When you do that, your calculator is going to tell you five. Because 5 times 5 times 5 times 5 is 625. For the v to the 8th, if I want the fourth root of v to the 8th, it's like me saying I have eight people and I want to put them into groups of four. Well, if I put them into groups of four, I'm only going to have two groups. So you're really just dividing 8 divided by 4 gives us that 2. That all stays in parentheses because it still needs taken to the third power. So I need to compute five to the third power, five times five times five, 125. And then V squared to the third, we divided to get the exponent out of the radical. And now we're going to multiply two times three to get six. Final answer, 125v to the sixth. Can you tell me how to calculate the numerator in your calculator? Like how to put it in your calculator? Yeah. So for your calculator, you're going to hit four. 
the second button, the carrot key, 625 equals. Mm -hmm. Questions on this one? Or two, or three. Questions 18 and 19, we're just expanding and condensing some logarithms. So just remember those rules, they're at the bottom of your reference sheet. I'll just go ahead and attach a reference sheet to the back of your test for your final. So you've all got it. So when we expand, in this case, we have log base eight, and then we have a quotient X to the third divided by Y squared. Keep in mind, this quotient looks like a minus sign, so when you break it apart, you're going to use subtraction. So log base eight of the numerator, x to the third, minus log base eight again of the denominator, y squared. The last thing you've got to do is that power property. These exponents can't stay there. They've got to be brought down to the front, so three log base eight of x minus, the two comes down to log base eight of y. Final answer. And if you write that all in one line and you don't show that middle step, it's okay. I believe you can bring those exponents down while you write your answer. For question 19, we're asked to do the exact opposite. We're condensing when you condense, the first thing you've got to get rid of, any number sitting out in front of your log using the power property. So log base three of m to the fourth minus, whoops, log base three of n to the eighth. We'll move those numbers out front up to be exponents. And again, since we have subtraction in this case, we're going to combine using the quotient. So log base three of m to the fourth divided by n to the eighth would be my final answer. Question number 20 says the length that a spring stretches varies directly with the weight that is attached. If a spring stretches 24 inches with 30 pounds attached, how far will it stretch with 10 pounds attached? And then we're told a hint to use a proportion. So really we're gonna use length divided by weight, whoops, equals the other length divided by the other weight. So we were given two numbers that go together. The first two numbers, the spring stretches 24 inches with 30 pounds attached. So my first fraction, I'm gonna use 24 inches over 30 pounds. Be careful with your second fraction, we're wanting to figure out how far will it stretch? So it's gonna stretch X inches, because we don't know how far it's gonna stretch, with 10 pounds attached, so 10 pounds. Then we're just going to cross multiply. So when I cross multiply, I'm gonna take 30 times X to get 30 X. I'm gonna take 10 times 24 to get 240. Then I'm gonna divide both sides by 30 to get an answer of X equals eight. Remember that label was in inches. So given the information that we were given, we would expect the spring to stretch eight inches with 10 pounds attached to it. Questions on this one. 
Question 21 says write the following equation in logarithmic form. Once you write it in log form, you're done. You don't have to evaluate anything. So I'm going to label my parts. This is, whoops, b to the x power equals y, and we want to rewrite it as log base b of y equals x. So we're going to rewrite according to this, which gives me log base 3, because 3 is b, of y, which is 81, equals my exponent, or my x in this case, 4. That conversion, again, is on your reference sheet that I'll attach to your final. All you have to do is rewrite it. You're not doing anything else with it. Question 22 says, solve the following radical equation. Don't forget to check for extraneous solutions. So here, to solve your logarithmic equation, the, or your radical equation, sorry, I don't know why I said that. So first thing you wanna do is isolate the radical. You wanna get the square root, in this case, by itself. Well, in this problem, there's nothing in front, underneath, or behind the radical, so it's already isolated for you. Once it's isolated, you want to eliminate it. To eliminate a square root, you're going to square both sides. So squaring our square root on the right side is going to cancel, leaving you a 31 minus 2n on the right side. The left side is where students tend to goof. So we're taking n plus 2 times n plus 2. to get n squared plus 2n plus 2n plus 4, which really means we have n squared plus 4n plus 4 on the left side. So a lot of times students will square the n and square the 2, and they miss that middle term there with the 4n. So I'll just do a little box problem, n plus 2 times n plus 2 over to the side. Then I notice we have a quadratic. Anytime you have a quadratic, you're going to try to move everything to one side and factor. So we're going to subtract 31 and add 2 in to both sides. So now we have n squared plus 6n minus 27 equals 0. We're going to use our asterisks to factor this. A value is 1, so 1 goes in the top left and the top right. 6 goes in the bottom middle. And negative 27 times 1 goes in the top middle. Then we're looking for two numbers that multiply to give us negative 27, but add to give us 6, negative 3, and positive 9. So now we have factors x minus 3 times x plus 9. Their product is 0. So using your zero product property, we're going to set them both equal to zero and solve for x. Make sure when you get down to the end, you've got to go back to the original and check to make sure these both work. So if I check three, so when I check three, I would have three plus two equals the square root of 31 minus two times three. 
So for the left side, I have five. For the right side, I'm gonna take two times three to get six. 31 minus six is 25. Is the square root of 25, five? Absolutely. So this first one checks out. When I go to check the negative nine, I would have negative nine plus two equals the square root of 31 minus two times negative nine. So when I simplify the left side here, I get negative seven equals the square root. Can a square root ever give me a negative number? No, I don't even have to finish the rest of this because I, all I have on the right side is a square root and I'm never gonna have a square root that equals negative seven. So this one's not going to work. It is extraneous. You only end up with one correct answer in this case. Questions on this one? 23, divide using the method of your choice. You can use long division or synthetic division. Synthetic division will be just a tad bit quicker. So keep in mind to find our magic number out here, we have to take what we're dividing by and set it equal to zero. So in this case, we're dividing by n plus 10, set it equal to zero to get negative 10. That's the magic number that sits out to the side. So negative 10 is gonna be that number on the ledge. To fill out the box, our coefficients go across the top so we have five into the third, so five goes first. 55 n squared, so that comes next. 49 n, and then our constant negative 17. The first term always comes down, so the five gets brought down. And then our process here is going to be to multiply and add, multiply and add until we fill out the whole box. So we're gonna multiply the magic number negative 10 times the number on the bottom. So negative 10 times five is negative 50. So we multiply to get that, then we're gonna add 55 and negative 50 add together to give me five. Repeat with the new five times negative 10, we're gonna get negative 50 again. And then we're gonna add 49 and negative 50 together to get negative one. Multiply the negative one times the magic number negative 10 to get positive 10. And then add negative 17 plus 10 to get negative seven. Hard work's done. Now we just get to use this bottom row as the coefficients for our answers. The last number is going to be our remainder. So first thing we have is a five. When we write oops, our answer, we're going to start one degree less than the original. So the original was n to the third, so that five is going to be n squared. Plus five n for the next term, minus one, and then your remainder, negative seven divided by n plus 10. So your remainder just gets divided by whatever you were dividing by originally. I move the negative down from the seven in between the two terms. And again, if you're more comfortable with long division, you could have used long division. Question 24, use the expression below to write your answer for parts A and through C. So what is the complex conjugate? Complex conjugate just means, hey, look at the denominator and change the sign in the middle. So in this case, eight plus six I becomes eight minus six I. 
why do we use the complex conjugate to eliminate I from the denominator? So our whole objective is to eliminate I from the denominator. So for part C, we're asked to simplify. We're just going to multiply the top and the bottom by the conjugate, eight minus six I. The top's the easy part. All you have to do is distribute. So I'm going to distribute 2 times 8 is 16, 2 times negative 6i is negative 12i. The bottom part is more complex. You have two terms being multiplied by two terms, which creates a box problem. So in my box, I'm going to multiply corresponding pieces. So 8 times 8, 64. 6i times 8i, 48i. For the bottom left, negative 6i times positive 8i, negative 48i. And then the tricky box, because you have i times i to give you i squared. Negative 6i times negative, I mean positive 6i is negative 36 i squared, take that i squared out, replace it with negative 1. Negative 1 times negative 36 is actually positive 36. So then when I go through and combine like terms, if you've done this correctly, your i's should cancel each other out. Positive 48i and negative 48i cancel. So for the denominator, you're really just going to add 64 plus 36, which gives you 100. You must, in this case, reduce because 16, 12, and 100 are all divisible by 4. That gives you 4 plus, oh, I mean minus, 3i divided by 25 for your final answer. Last page, question 25, if you drink a beverage with 80 milligrams of caffeine each hour, the caffeine decreases by 15%, how much caffeine will you have left in your system after three hours? So this is talking about that exponential growth or decay. Every hour, that caffeine is decreasing by 15%. So remember, you've got to find your growth or decay rate, decide whether you're using one plus or one minus, Yes, in this case, we're using one minus. So y equals the initial amount of 80 milligrams. And we're using one minus because our caffeine level in our system is decreasing. 15% converts to 0.15 as a decimal. And then our time frame for our exponent is going to be three hours. So you can just type this in your calculator the way it's written to get a value of 49.13 milligrams of caffeine in your system after three hours. All right, question 26. A foul ball leaves the end of a baseball bat and travels according to the formula H of t equals negative 16t squared plus 80t. H represents the height of the ball and t is the time in seconds. 
How long does it take the ball to reach a height of 96 feet in the air? So what they're giving you here with the 96, you have to decide whether it goes in here or if it goes in here and here. So you have to decide, is that a height or is it a time? Most definitely a height. So you're plugging it in right here for H of T. So the height at time T happens in this case to be 96. So we're gonna have 96 equals negative 16 T squared plus 80 T. Again, a quadratic, you're always going to want to get zero on one side. So subtract 96. Now I've got a quadratic, but if I were to fill out my asterisks, according to these numbers, I would end up with some ugly numbers that I would have to use to factor. The best thing for you to do here is to divide every single term by whatever sitting in front of t squared, in this case, negative 16. So divide all the terms, in this case, by negative 16. I promise it will work. The same method will work on your final. So if I divide every single term by negative 16, zero divided by negative 16 is still zero. Negative 16 t squared divided by negative 16 just gives me one t squared. 80 t divided by negative 16 is negative five t. Negative 96 divided by negative 16 is positive six. And now these numbers are much easier to put into your asterisks. So instead of having huge numbers, now you're looking for two things that multiply to give you six and add to give you, whoops, negative five, negative two times negative three. Oh, I guess I'm sorry. So t minus two times t minus three equals zero. Use your zero product property to determine what t equals. Oops. So I'm getting t values of two and three. Is it realistic that a ball could be at a height of 96 feet at two seconds and three seconds. Well, if you think about it, it's gonna go up and it's gonna come back down. So say this is 96 feet, it's gonna hit it, it's gonna go above it for a little bit and then it's gonna come back down. Both of these are realistic. So really what you're looking for, if you get a negative time for something, it's gonna be extraneous. In this case, we got two positives. So at two seconds and three seconds, the ball would be at a height of 96 feet. So last two questions are some older review we're gonna go over them. You should have seen these before in the past. If not, they're really pretty simple. So question 27, we have a bag that contains six black marbles and four white marbles. Sarah randomly selects one marble, puts it back, and then randomly selects another. What is the probability that both selections were black? So there are six black marbles in the bag. So six out of, there's a total of 10 marbles in this case. So the first probability, if she picks a marble, she's got six out of 10 chance of selecting a black marble. But then Sarah's gonna do it again. So Sarah's gonna take and put that marble that she first drew, put it back in there. So she, then she's gonna repeat the process. She's got again a six out of 10 shot of getting a black marble. So really all we need to do is multiply these two together, six tenths times six tenths. Six times six is 36, 10 times 10 is 100. 
that actually reduces to nine twenty fifths. So she's got a nine and twenty five chance that she picks two black marbles in a row. Questions on this one? So the question on your test would be really similar. They might not be black and white marbles. They might be yellow and green. And then for the last question, I want to go over it because it's worth a lot of points on your test. Mean, median, and range. When you do problems like this, the first thing I want you to do is rewrite the numbers in numerical order. So when I look at Northeastern, I want to put them in order from smallest to largest. So 150, 156, 162, and then 178. So to calculate your mean, mean is just a fancy way of saying the average. To find the average, you're going to add all the numbers up and divide them by however many numbers there are. In this case, there's four numbers. Add them together, you get, whoops, 646. I'm gonna divide that by four because there's four numbers. And that tells me that the mean is 161.5. The median, the median means the middle. So I'm gonna to go to the middle. In this case, since there are four numbers, technically these two are both in the middle. If you have two numbers in the middle, you have to find the average of those two. Add them together, 156 plus 162 is 318. Divide it by two, since there are two of them, to get your median of 159. And then your range, you're talking about the difference between the smallest value and the largest value. So you just take the largest value, the last number on your list, and you subtract the smallest number on your list. And that's going to tell you the range, in this case, 28. So on your test, you're actually going to have, I think it's nine points of finding mean, median, and range for three different sets of data. It's gonna look similar to this, except it's gonna have another column down at the end. So again, to calculate, first thing I would do, rewrite them in numerical order. So for the second one, central is gonna be 200, 204, 210, and 220. Find the mean, add them all up, and divide them by four. If I add them all up, I get 834. I'm gonna divide them by four to get 208.5. And again, since we had an even number of data points, to find my median, it's gonna be the middle two. I'm gonna add them together and divide by two. So 414 divided by 2 gives us 207. If on your test you were given five numbers, you would just pick the one in the middle and you wouldn't have to do that step. So if there's an odd number, you just pick the number that's directly in the middle. And then the last one for your range, you're going to take the largest number minus the smallest number. So 220 minus 200 is just 20. So our range for that last one, just 20.